We begin our, our journey of Advent, we begin our journey of Advent, and one of the things we are doing is we're going to be looking at Christ's birth in the Gospel of Luke and focusing on the Gospel of Luke. It's interesting, there are four Gospels which tell the story. They're not really histories, they're, they're historical, but they're not really histories, but they tell the story of Jesus. Uh, and it's interesting, really outside of the Bible, uh, to my knowledge, there's only one uh, reference to Jesus, and that was from a Jewish historian named Josephus who mentioned Jesus as an itinerant Jewish preacher, uh, or teacher, a rabbi, and, and that he was uh, killed on a cross. So we really learn about Jesus in, in the Gospels. That's where we first learn about, the, about Jesus, is in the Gospels. And only two of the Gospels, Matthew and Luke, actually refer, have any reference to the birth of Jesus. They tell the story of the birth of Jesus. Some people suggest that Matthew sort of tells it from, predominantly from Joseph's perspective, or he's sort of the main character in there. Luke tells uh, it from Mary's perspective, or we hear more about Mary in Luke's Gospel. But we're going to think about this idea of, of, of Christ's birth in the Gospel of Luke. And we come face to face with the person of Mary, the mother of Jesus. We know that Mary was probably between 13 and 15 years of age when she was betrothed to Joseph. That was common in that, in that time. That was common in that time. And we know that in, in, in Jewish tradition that when, when two, uh, uh, a man and a woman were married, they were generally arranged by their families, by the parents. They were arranged by the parents. We know that uh, when they arranged the marriage, and the first, the, the marriage actually takes place in two steps. The first step is what they call the betrothal or the engagement, what we might call an engagement. But it's much more informal, it's more formal engagement. For example, once this couple, say Mary and Joseph, are engaged, if you will, or betrothed to be married, the wedding comes down the line, the engagement can last a year. In order to break the engagement, it's con it was considered a divorce. It was considered a divorce. We see in Matthew's Gospel, uh, when Joseph finds out about that Mary is with child, she's pregnant with child, he considers divorcing her. Even though they're not married, they were betrothed, they were engaged. It was a big deal at that time. One of the interesting things about Mary to our knowledge, Mary is the only person who was present at both the birth and the death of Jesus. One of my favorite uh, pieces of art is Michelangelo's sculpture, the Pieta. We have a, uh, a, a replica of it in painting in our narthex. It's, it's, it's the sculpture which Mary is actually holding the dead body of Jesus after he's taken down from the cross. I remember in 1972, uh, a deranged man from Hungary uh, actually was in St. Peter's Basilica and, and took a hammer, crawled over the barrier, and actually tried to destroy that piece of art, that work of art. And the interesting thing, and I, I don't know, I don't know what was really behind it, but he was able to 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 uh, to disfigure. Michelangelo's Pieta in two areas. One was the face of Mary, and one was the arm of Mary. I always wondered, what was behind that? Did he have something against Mary? I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles with me uh, to this passage in Luke's Gospel. First chapter, beginning at verse 26. Listen as God speaks to us through his word. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. 
How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your faithful presence in our lives. I thank you, Lord God, for revealing to us something about the mother of your son, Jesus, the mother of our Savior and our Lord. Thank you for using her to reveal to us what it means to walk in the depth of faithfulness. We thank you for all of your good gifts in the name of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Gabriel, when we first see this passage, uh, we're introduced immediately to Gabriel, the angel. Now, who was Gabriel? Uh, if you go back to Daniel, the eighth and ninth chapter, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel speaks to, to Daniel. Uh, the reality is the, the word angel is really a word for messenger. It's a way in which God speaks uh, to us. Uh, the word Gabriel literally means in Hebrew, strength of God. Uh, Gabriel may not have said, hey, I'm Gabriel. I want to tell you, Gabriel was probably a name given within Jewish custom and tradition to this this messenger, when, when someone received a message from God. And when you look at how Mary, we, we look at this and it looks like a conversation that maybe occurred over a few minutes. We really don't know that. I mean, the Bible, uh, again, doesn't give, give us every detail of, of, of what's going on in their lives. This actually could have been a conversation that lasted a few minutes. It could have been a conversation that lasted over a period of hours, maybe even days. It also doesn't necessarily mean that, that Mary was sitting there and all of a sudden, Angel Gabriel appeared to her and she could see this angel. I mean, if you go back to the first chapter in Matthew's gospel, uh, it says that, that God came to Joseph in a dream to tell him that, that Mary was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. But then later it says, it goes on to say, in, 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 in later in, verse, in chapter 1, it says, what the angel had commanded Joseph. So the, an angel came to, to, to Joseph in a dream. Now, it doesn't look like that angel Gabriel came to Mary in a dream, but what's probably happened here is that Mary is just sensing the voice of God. She's sensing the voice of God here. And I want us to think together about Mary. I grew up a uh, Southern Baptist in Nashville, Tennessee. But it's interesting, the neighborhood in which I grew up was a largely Catholic neighborhood. Our family, I was the oldest of four children. We were the smallest family in our neighborhood. The Lau family had 18 children. They, drove, they, they had two Volkswagen buses. You know, I used to think that our, our family with four kids was chaotic. Then I would go to the Lows and it was like, my gosh, I couldn't even remember everybody. I'm just going to remember the kids' names. But I grew up in that Catholic neighborhood and I was always hearing about Mary from my friends. They were praying to Mary. There was even when down at Christ the King Church in Nashville, we would go down there and ride our bikes down there. And there was this... Uh, this pile of rocks that when I was a child, it seemed like it was 50 feet tall. It was probably about 10 feet tall. Uh, and on the top was a statue of Mary. And we used to play a game. Whoever could climb up the rocks and touch Mary's head first would win. And so, but Mary was a central part of my childhood, really through my Roman Catholic friends. I grew up Baptist. We never heard about Mary. 
Nobody talked about Mary in the Baptist church. It was like the only time I remember my grandmother mentioning Mary was she would say, we don't think a lot about Mary. The Catholics do. It, it was always something that you hid. You just didn't want to talk about Mary. But I want us to think together this morning about Mary. We don't, as Protestants, we don't see any warning in Scripture that we, that we are to pray to Mary or even to, to God through Mary. But we do acknowledge that we pray alongside Mary. We pray with Mary. And I want us to think together about how we might learn some things about Mary's faith. This was a young woman who's 13 to 15 years of age. But I've learned through the years, I've learned a lot of things from young people. We gotta keep our eyes open. Specifically, I want us to think about what we learned from Mary by looking at four words that begin with the letter A. The first word that begins with the letter A is the word attentive. To be attentive is one of the hallmarks, one of the marks of faithfulness. Mary was attentive. Simone Weil, who was a, a French philosopher in the 1930s and became a Christian, she said that, that Mary, uh, one of the marks of her faithfulness was her attentiveness her tentativeness to God. If you look here in verses 26 through 29, Gabriel, angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says to her, greetings you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was attentive to the voice of God. As I said, it wasn't so much, it's, in fact, it's not likely that Mary's sitting there and this angel appears so she can see her, but Mary, hears the voice of God or senses the voice of God. I want you to stop and think for a moment. I want you to raise your hand. I want you to think for a moment. If you've ever either heard the voice of God or you've sensed the voice of the presence of God in your life, raise your hand. We've had an experience like Mary. That's, that's likely what happened with Mary. You know, Gabriel didn't come in and say, here, let's have a cup of coffee and I want to talk to you about some things. It was Mary sensing the presence of God. But the tragic thing is quite often, most people, even many people who are Christians, if not most, simply go through life so busy and so focused on ourselves that we're not attentive to the voice of God. But Mary is. So often we get so caught up in our own lives that we're not looking for God. We're not listening for God. We're not even anticipating that God may be speaking to us or may want to speak to us in any given situation. But Mary is attentive to God. Well, last week when I talked about praying unceasingly, we talked about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What it means to pray, to live prayerfully is to, to walk through our days being attentive to God. Now, I, I understand. I don't know that anybody does that all the time. And Mary probably didn't either. But here is a young girl who is attentive to God. She's cognizant of God's creation. She's cognizant of his will. She's cognizant of his plan. And she is listening. So often, again, we get caught up and we're not aware. We're not looking for a voice from God, so we're not hearing it. A number of years ago, when I was in seminary, I spent a summer serving as a chaplain intern at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. I remember one day, I was responsible for two particular wings in the hospital, and so I would, I would visit on those, those, those wards. One day, it was a beautiful fall afternoon, I was out on the veranda and, uh, and just enjoying lunch. I brought a sandwich, I was sitting there just eating lunch, and, and minding my own business. And I remember sitting there that day eating that sandwich and I happened to look over about 30, 40 feet away from me. There was a young couple over there. They were just sitting there at a, t at a table on the veranda crying. Well, I was sitting there eating and I saw them crying and so I just kept eating and I saw them crying and they were, I mean, they were visibly crying. They were emotional. And I remember thinking to myself, should I go over there? And I thought, no, I'm eating my lunch. It's my lunch hour. 
So I ate for a little bit and they continued to cry and I kept thinking, should I go over there? And then I thought, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to intrude on them. And, and, and then it was, like, it was like this voice. I thought, how you're a chaplain. Wake up. So I laid my sandwich down and I walked over. I had no idea what I was about to walk into. I walked in, I, I walked over and introduced myself and they invited me to sit down and they began to tell me that their 10 month old son, their only child, had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. And the child had just been declared brain dead and they were having to make, they were faced with the decision to take him off a ventilator. I'm gonna be honest with you. My first thought was, I should have stayed eating my lunch. That's the last place I wanted to be. We spent the next four hours talking with the resident understanding what, what that means, the condition of their child, and then making a decision as a moral decision to withdraw life support for their child, and then going in the room and doing it. Attentive. I don't know that I was particularly attentive. I think I, I, I resisted. But oftentimes God, is, God wants to speak to us throughout every day. God has an interest in everything we are doing. And what we see in Mary is that she was attentive. And that's a mark of her faithfulness. The second word is the word anguish. The word anguish. You don't think about anguish as being a mark of faith, but, but we see it in, in Mary. Angel Gabriel says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And then Mary's, it says something about Mary, that Mary was greatly troubled. The word means perplexed or, or anxious, even fearful. The angel even says, don't be afraid. The angel saw fear in Mary and says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The idea that anguish and anxiety. We see this, sometimes we look at this and think, well, Mary faltered in her faith. She didn't falter in her faith. She had an experience of God, God speaking to her, and she was greatly troubled by it. Let me tell you, if you don't experience any anguish in your walk with God, if you're not greatly troubled sometimes by what God tells you, then you're probably not very attentive to your relationship with God. Mary, mark of her faith was her anguish. Like I said, when I walked into that situation that afternoon at Vanderbilt Medical Center, I had no idea what I was getting into. As I said, the first thing I thought, and I'm almost embarrassed to say this, when, I, when they told me what was going on was I should have minded my own business. Because that's the last place I wanted to be. Sometimes God calls us into tough situations. Mary was greatly troubled even by the, just sensing the voice of God. But then when, when the angel goes on and tells her what he has in mind, I mean, she's like, it says here, verse 34, I read it like this. How will this be, Mary, asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? I doubt that's what, how Mary said it. She probably thought, now how will this be you know I, she, she's troubled by this it's like how is this going to happen i'm a virgin mary was anguished by what the spirit of god was telling her in this situation number one we know that especially after she found out that she would be pregnant she knew that there would be a scandal she had to have been anguished about that we know joseph was because he thought about divorcing her. If you look over in chapter 2, when Jesus is presented at the table, Simeon tells Mary, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Mary had to have been anguished, wondering, what does it mean that I will give birth to the Messiah? It can't be all good. 
she anguished over this. If you go back, Moses, remember when Moses, God comes to Moses and says, I've got a job for you. What's Moses' response? I can't do that. That's exactly where Mary probably thought, what am I supposed to do? How is this going to happen? She is greatly troubled. Anguish is a mark of faithfulness. Like I said, if you don't experience any anguish or anxiety in your relationship with God, when God speaks to you and gives a word or direction to your life, then you're probably not attentive to God. That leads us to the third word, and that is the word all. The word all. And I think it, it, it belongs right beside anguish. Verse uh, 29, it says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words, and she wondered what kind of greeting this might be. She asked, how is this going to happen? I mean, she was kind of in awe of what was going on. She certainly did not understand. She didn't comprehend everything that was going on here. Again, if you go over to chapter 2, after the birth, in verse 19, it says, Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. Even after the birth of Jesus, she's still wondering, what is this going to mean for me? I mean, she is in the presence of God. Oftentimes we think of our relationship with God, we think of Jesus as our friend, and he is our friend. But that doesn't mean that we are equals. Mary understood that she was not an equal with God. That when the voice of God came to her, she experienced a sense of awe in this relationship. You see, I think if we live faithful lives, that we will experience more and more wow moments in our lives. When God speaks to us. When Mary finally comes to verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, or, or here I am your servant, Lord. May it be to me as you have said. That didn't mean that she understood or comprehended everything that was going to happen. What it meant was that she knew she was in the presence of God. And if God was speaking something to her, then that was important. That was significant. I still look back at that situation at Vanderbilt Divinity School and standing there that afternoon in that hospital room with that 10-month-old little baby and, and, and having a time of prayer and then removing that child from a ventilator and watching the child stop breathing is one of the most awe-inspiring moments I've ever experienced. Awe is a part of the walk of faith. That leads us to the last word, available. Mary was available. Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, may it be to me as you have said. Again, that doesn't mean that, like I said, doesn't mean Mary understood everything or comprehended it all, but she was available to God and she was willing to trust God. She, I'm sure, had a sense that this would include, this journey would include both rejoicing and mourning. But she chose to trust God. As God chose to favor her, she chose to trust God. It reminds me of the passage in Genesis 12 when God comes to Abram and Sarah and says, I want you to leave your country, to leave your people, to leave your family. What I want you to do is I want you to go to the land that I will show you. He didn't say where. He said, I want you to trust me. Mary was willing to trust God. Attentiveness, anguish or anxiety, awe and availability. Those are four important marks of what it means to be faithful that we see in Mary, the mother of Jesus. We don't pray to Mary, but we joyfully pray with her. She is the mother of our Lord and Savior, to be highly revered, but she is also our sister in Christ. 